Are we all doing good? Yeah? Yeah? Good. Get your Bible out. And uh, who's been enjoying the series so far? Who's really glad of all the stuff you're learning for those other people in your lives who are really annoying? <laughs> Isn't that right? And uh, th- these are the kind of talks that people, people tend to go, uh, you know, you hand them out, but you really need to listen to this. You know, just have you been listening to it? Because it's, it's really important. But there's, there's grace for you this morning because it was for freedom that Christ came to set you free. Amen. And so uh, in this church, it is all about his, his work and his power. And, and uh, and you receiving that. And one thing I'm absolutely sure about is that uh, when we talk, you know, let me just recap and tell you why it matters that we're talking about this today, because I absolutely believe that in hearing the Lord for 2018, that he said to start off by clearing. As You know, we, we talk every week about receiving and receiving and receiving. And sometimes there are things that sit in our hearts. And it's not that we go on a fishing expedition to find out what's wrong. Remember, I told the story about how I would sit in life groups in other churches, and uh, when I went there, and, you know, they would say in, in talks like this, well, you know, have you ever been offended? And you go, oh, yes, offended. Oh. I think it was 1983. Could have been 84. Christmas 84. Somebody looked at me the wrong way, and I just, but the Lord. You know, I mean, we get totally unreal about it. And uh, th- this is not about you having to dig things up, but it's to really look at your heart and say, Lord, what's in here? And I'm going to show you um, today and I'm going to get very practical. I'm going to take it quite slowly because I want, you, I want this to really land. So I'm not going to rush. I'm not going to... And just listen to the Lord and give ear to what he's saying because what you plant in your life today, what you plant and what you receive today will bear fruit. There will be freedom that you're not walking in today currently that you will walk in three, four, five, six months from now. Do you hear me? And what happens is when the word comes and you let that word sit, you've got to receive the word. And you've got to allow the word to sit in your heart because it's not just um, a case of you hear. Faith comes by hearing, continue, but allowing that word to take root in your heart. And the interesting thing is many people live frustrated and they live with this sense of, well, this grace thing is, is fantastic. I understand the gospel of grace, but it's all up here. And remember, it's not about up here or behavior modification. It's about heart transformation and living from the inside out is the way that I describe it. It's live from the inside out. And, and uh, you know, more, most often than not, there's stuff that sits in our hearts and it, and it blocks the life of God flowing because it, it draws us back to self. I've explained this over two weeks, so you need to go and listen to that online. But I'm gonna talk today about, you know, it's one thing to get, it, get yourself into the place where you find that actually the Lord starts to speak about not just something that might be there, but how do you keep living free? Because people will do your papping, won't they? Yeah, I'm trying not to look at anyone in particular, Samuel, <laughs> but people do your papping. I don't know about you. I mean, the thing is, um, Christians aren't very good. Oh, bless you, brother. Yes, amen, and all that. We don't, we don't do that, do we? But you know what I mean? And, uh, oops, that's going to be an interesting one for the podcast. And, uh, but, but you know what I mean? Christians get all kind of, you know, so flipping heads up in the clouds and not dealing with real life stuff. But it's the real life stuff that causes the separation, the hurt, and the pain. And so the interesting thing about being in a thing of, uh, in an environment of grace is that because there is no judgment in grace about sin, okay, now listen, I'm going to back all this up from the word. You're free to know that, you should be free to know that I am truly loved. And if I'm in an environment, this is why this church matters. When we talk about helping you to discover the love of God and to thrive and to find that place where you can truly live, what that means is it it, it takes us to be big enough men and women that when we see stuff in other people that we don't like, that we just don't do what the world does or what religious people do. Because religion measures people by what they do. Jesus measures you by who you are called to be. All right? And actually, you'll find grace flow when we look and we view each other as Christ intended. But that's a challenge because people do your papa. You know, it would be great if we could sing a few worship songs, wouldn't it, before you had to interact with anybody? Like, what would it be like if going into work tomorrow morning, you just, mm, i never lose its power for me. Okay, I'm good to go. Then you walk in, you go, look at the bake on her, flipping Nora. <laughs> All right? Does that ever happen? All right? So you maybe get up in the morning and go, look at the bake on her. And... Uh, Like, what's going on? But you get my point, and then all of a sudden, it's all going fine until you actually had to get out of bed and actually deal with somebody. 
your kids do your head in, your husband, wife, whatever, does your head in, the dog does your head in. Uh, that's why I'm not getting a dog ever. Bless you people with dogs. But you know what I mean? Amen. amen. All right. You're giving lots of amens there, Samuel. I'm going to preach to you this morning. <laughs> but is it possible actually to stop the rot before you have to deal with what's in your heart? I believe that it is. And I believe that it's only grace that gets you to the place where actually rather than having to deal with stuff that sits in our heart, actually grace can stop you and help you and protect you and create the environment where actually it's much less likely to sit. And let's look at that today. So we're going to look at Ephesians 4. It says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, I'm going to look at lots of scripture actually, urge you to walk in a manner uh, worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So th this is Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. And he says this, you've been called to this. You know, the thing that I love is to, I, I hate the feeling in myself. Can I be really honest? I don't like me whenever I'm full of stuff. Do you get that? When you're feeling anxious or upset with someone or they're living rent-free in your head, I don't like that. I don't like the me who has to live like that. I don't like the fact that my head is pulled in lots of different directions. I don't like feeling the bitterness inside of me. Do you get me? And I have to remind myself, the, the reason why as a believer that I don't like it or I feel kind of yucky, is because I was called for so much more. You were called for better. And actually, it's his calling in your life, which goes, actually, you don't, the reason why you don't like it is you were never called to live in it. You were, you were saved for so much more. And, and Paul goes on to all that, but I'm going to come to it. With all humility and all gentleness and with patience, bearing with one another in love. Well, that's easy if people are lovable, but if they're not lovable, that's pretty tricky. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is only one body and one spirit. So this is it. Have a look around you. This is it. One body of believers meeting all around. We've only got one spirit, and that's the spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So I, I, I'm just saying that to go, there is a sense here when Paul's writing to the church of Ephesus where he's going, listen, be better. And it's not a case of be better and try harder. He's going, God has put something in you. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, has called you into the one body. And he says, you're called for something better. So many times over these last few years where I have seen, even in myself, but good people and good believers fall and kid themselves that they are right in the will of God. But they're not. They're bound in hurt, offense, pain, and bitterness. And sometimes when something is like that, we just need to call it. Because the human beings in our have the unbelievable ability to take any situation, turn it about self, and make it everybody else's problem, and then say it was Jesus who caused it in the first place. And so we see people separate and people split, and it was always the will of God. You will know when the Holy Spirit is at move in your life and in the people around you when there is one body, one spirit, and unity. All right? But that is tough. That's hard work. If you try to do it with yourself, but when you sit at the feet of Jesus, like I said, and you receive, it becomes so much easier. So let's, let's have a look, because I'm going to talk uh, about, about this word judgment. And uh, it's an interesting word, but let's look at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 5, because we're going to look at a story of, of how people judge Jesus and what the result was. Because if you're sitting wondering to yourself, why does it matter? Well, let me tell you. Uh, he went away from there, and he came to his hometown, uh, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? Now, they're not going, where did he get these things? All right? The sense here is, who the flip does this guy think he is? All right? Where did he, like, seriously, take a wise, as we would say in Belfast, wise up. That's the sense that you get in the language when you look at it. How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James and jo Joseph, and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, and among his relatives, and in his own household. And he could not do mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Now, if it happens to Jesus, it happens to you. Two things I want you to see. The people took offense, and then they did not show him any honor. I'm going to look at the second one, because I've dealt with the first one over the last two weeks. What does it mean? 
And, and why does it matter that we do not judge? Because what you see in this picture is you have people who knew, so there's a closeness, there's a, there's a good picture of, this is not people who are far away, this is people who are up close. Jesus grew up in this place, they knew him from a wee fella, and they knew what he was like, they knew his family, they knew all about him. And what they did was, they judged him. How do we know that? Well, the Greek word for judging, in this sense, is time, and it means to um, it's, it's, it's the word to honor, sorry. And it means that um, you treat something as valuable. It means that you put weight into it. You make it valuable. It's precious. It's weighty. You have an appreciation. And um, there's that sense of, of weight around who you're looking at. Now, they didn't do that. It says they didn't honor Jesus. The antonym here, the other word, the opposite word, is atimia. And it means that they didn't show respect or they treated him as ordinary and as menial. You understand that? Now, so what happens is when they look at Jesus, they get offended by what he has to say. And so they just treat him like anybody else. They did not treat him and honor him and value him and respect him for who he was. Okay? The Messiah. And what was the result? The result was there was no life that flowed. Do you get that? If you look at your life and you wonder at times why there's no life flowing, I'm just going to suggest it may just be, many, it could be many, but it may just be one of the reasons that I believe that underpins that and why we're trying to deal with this in our heart is because not only is it about how we view God, it's about how we view each other and how we judge each other. Because when we judge, we are under law. And what we do is we judge according to the law based on something which Jesus never judges people over. And the result is a lack of life that flows. Does that make sense to you? Does it make sense, yes or no? Okay. Because it's important that we grasp this. Now, it can be displayed in action, in word and thought, okay? But honor or dishonor always comes from your heart. True honor, truly giving somebody value truly appreciating them, truly giving them weight in their place, truly seeing them as who Jesus has called them to be, is an outflow, remember, of a heart that loves God. And as you receive the love of Jesus, you receive the grace of Jesus, that flows. It is not coming from you. You will not naturally love people in a way which will overcome offense when it comes. It has to be a supernatural flow. It has to be. And that's why I said it's so important that we, when we look at the story of Mary and Martha, the whole point is, you know, she was so worried about everything else because she had forgotten this one thing. She had forgotten what it meant to rest in the presence of her Savior and receive his life and his love. Just stay connected and the life that was in him would flow. And Jesus said, you're so stressed out about everything else because you're not doing this. You get me? And then what you see is whenever we, we look at people, whether it's Jesus or somebody else, and there is dishonor in our hearts, it's very hard for life to flow. Why? Because in dishonor, there is judgment, which is law, and we're not under law. And there was no blessing in life flowing under law. Do you get that? And that's, that's, the sto that's what I want to talk to you about. How do you stop doing that? It's interesting that it's not just about, oh, bless you, sister, love you, in Jesus' name and all that. It's about what comes out of here because what I find with Christians is, and myself at times, I'm really good at playing the game. I'm really good at putting the, fronting it up. But actually my heart, as I explained to you over the last couple of weeks, my heart got into a very dark place, particularly over the last five or six years. And the Lord had to really heal us both. And so, you know, what I realized was, is this. It says it actually in Isaiah 29, because the people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That's why it's so important not just to think about bit, modifying your behavior in this respect, but simply allowing the Lord to speak to you about what's really inside you. And here, here's what I find. Some people go, well, is this about, you know, this whole idea about sowing and reaping? It says here in, Luke's, in, in uh, Luke 6, it says, given it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be put into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. In verse 37, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will, not be, for and you will be forgiven. Now, it's really interesting. There is no law of sowing and reaping when it comes to Jesus. Can I just say that? 
You thank God this morning that you do not get what you sow. You get you reap what he sowed. Do you get that? Yeah. Really important. It's that thing of being punished. People go, oh, you know, that's sowing and reaping, brother. It's in the Bible. You know, and I go, thank goodness that I just get to reap all of his goodness. I get to reap everything. You know, there's no sowing and reaping when it comes to the Lord in that respect. You get me? You know, he, he sowed, he worked, I get to reap. All right? With people, though, it's different. And we need to be aware of that. To me, the, these verses are about giving mercy, passing judgment, and condemning, etc. But the whole principle is this. What I give people emotionally and relationally is what they give back to me. But what is very interesting is that, I, I read this quote, let me just read it. People respond to me in direct accordance with what I give them with one exception. They always give me so much more than what I give. So the principle is this, as I sow love, I will, I will reap more love. But if I sow judgment, relationally and emotionally, that's what I will receive. Not what the Lord gives you, but what people give you. When kindness and love gets sown, guess what comes back? Kindness and love, but so much more than what you sowed in the first place. With criticism and judgment, it is the same. So how do we get into it? Uh, let, let me just say this. We do not understand what goes on in people's hearts. Whenever we cross the line into going, I know why they did something and not what they did, we have call, slipped into what the, world, the, the word calls judgment. It's all about significance. Let me explain to you this way. The effect that someone's behavior has on you, all right? Why, why, why do people hurt us? Or why do we feel offended? Well, it's based on two factors. The first one would, is this. Number one, what is our motive whenever we do the same thing? So when I behave that way, or someone behaves that way with me, what we judge in ourselves is, well, this is what I would be like in that situation. So therefore, they must be the same. Do you get that? The second thing is this, is the significance with which we attach. Now, what I'm going to say to you is what we see in the Word is that the effect of somebody's behavior has little or nothing to do with his or her intent, but it's everything to do with how we measure it. And that's what Jesus says don't do. For example, you know, if somebody, you know when you get your hair cut? Samuel, you must know this all the time, right? <laughs> Whenever you get your hair cut, right? And people say, Samuel, I love what you've done with your hair this morning. Or maybe they don't, and you get offended. You know what I mean? <laughs> For those in the podcast, Samuel doesn't have a hair on his head, all right? But if somebody looks at us funny, or they fail to compliment us in a certain way, okay, what do we go? Oh, they don't love us. They don't care. Look at your man, all right? That's just a judgment that you've made in that moment. What we do is we attach significance to insignificant things, and then based on our judgment, it all comes back to us. Does that make sense? I'm trying to help you to understand what goes on in you and why you get yourself into a place where your heart can go dark and then you cut yourself off from life. People just do, do things. Some things are completely insignificant, but we attach significance to them. Now, at that point, they could all be resolved. You could deal with your heart and go, well, you know, was it personal? Probably not. I, I, I've long since given up trying to make everyone else's stuff about me. What I, I quickly discovered was uh, you, even the story that I told you about what happened here, we happen to be, you know, it's like if, if you th just think of your world like a circle and your circles collide, sometimes you're just in the way of other people's stuff. And it's not about you, it's about them and what they're doing, but your world collides a little. Do you get that? But the, the work of the enemy, though, is to get you to judge them in that moment and set the trap that you get, you get hooked. Don't take the bait. And that's why judgment is so important. You could deal with your heart there, couldn't you? Go out and sort it out with a person. Hey, said Samuel, you didn't compliment me on my hair this morning. Oh, sorry, mate. It just looks like it does every other week. Ah, oh, but that's no, no, see what it did there. We better, we better miss our pledge at the top or whatever that was, right? <laughs> so you could sort it out and Samuel and I would kiss and make up. Or we can go home angry, frustrated. And like I said, what we do is then we talk to somebody else. Samuel goes and talks to Adam and goes, see what your man said about my head this morning? Didn't even notice what I'd done with it. That's because he doesn't care. It's all about him. So in seed, so in seed, so in seed. Remember I said the worst kind of offense to take is somebody else's offense. Bonkers, plan of the enemy. Judge, make a decision. Judge the motive of why they did it, not what they did. All along, leading you in breadcrumbs to a place called Scandalon where the trap comes, 
and you're in prison. But where did it start? It started with judgment. Now, what's, what's interesting for me is that, you know, we, we, there is a way of breaking free, and it is in the gospel of grace. And we've got to stop assuming and attaching significance, number one. How do we do that? Well, this is what I love about grace, all right? It teaches us to be observers and not judges. And I'm speaking very personally here uh, from, my, from our own journey, but, you know, what I said to you last week was the only way to break free from offense and bitterness and unforgiveness in your life or to stop it getting a, a, a foothold in your life is to receive because there is nothing natural about forgiving those who hurt you. There is nothing natural about it. If you wait and you read all the books, the 10 steps to glory, the 15 steps to forgiveness, the crunch your eyes and grind your teeth and just press through to glory and it's all about you, all you'll do is reinforce the bitterness in your life because you'll feel disappointed that you can't break free from it. And what we do instead is we receive grace upon grace. We behold Jesus and we receive his love and his goodness. And as we behold him, 2 Corinthians 3.18 tells us, in beholding him, we are changed into the same image, the same likeness from glory to glory. All right? And the only way then to receive freedom is then, therefore, as we receive, and here's the interesting thing about this. It goes right back to the start. You know when Adam, you know whenever we read about Adam back at the very beginning? Um, in God's original plan, uh, prior to the fall, Adam was an observer of all that was good. Do you get that? Adam observed and walked with God and observed all that was good. There was no judgment at that time. There was no need for judgment. There was no fear. As what's really, really interesting is that we know that in 1 John 4, it says that perfect love casts out fear. And what, what, I, what I see with people's sin and people's mess and why, why we tend to judge is when, whenever we're afraid of something or whenever something cuts across us, we try to control it, okay? Now, the interesting thing is when we look at Jesus, this is why you've got to receive directly from Father. You've got to receive his love because he never tries to control you in any way because he loves you perfectly. So by, if you want to know what perfect love looks like, it looks like a lack of control. When we feel hurt, our response is with sin, we try to control it. And we do that by either taking offense and getting back into ourselves, or we try to control what other people think about those people. Do you get that? But when, when Jesus loves perfectly, okay, when he, as, he, as he loves you perfectly, he doesn't control you in any way. So in love and its pureness means freedom to choose. Isn't that right? Does it? And you see that right back at the very beginning. There was no judgment. There was no fear. Now, whenever we get afraid of something, what is said to us or what people do or what they think and we get offended, we try to control. And interestingly for me, when we live in a revelation then of God's love and grace and favor, what you should see in your life is there's less of a need to try to control other people or control what's happening. Does that make sense? And I see that time and time again in my own life. I see it time and time again with people where I go, oh, they said that and they're doing this and what does that mean for me? And, and, and I'm, I'm trying to desperately control, you know, sometimes the situation, sometimes myself. And the Lord says, listen, if I love you perfectly, I don't control you. I give you total freedom. Now you can live in that same freedom as you receive perfect love. And then it starts to make sense to me. I go, right, the angst that I feel at times and the, the, the agitation and all that is simply me trying to control what's going on around because I feel it's my responsibility. But it's not. What do I do in that moment? Keep going or just turn? Say, Jesus, show me your love. Right now, I need, I need love. Because I know that the fruit of love is that I don't control I give people space and freedom. That's why 1 Peter 4, 8 says this, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. In Romans 13, 8, I love this, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Can I really encourage you this week to go back to your first call, your first priority, and that's to be people who love. People who look and don't see the ordinary in each other but see each other as sons, see each other as daughters, 
We don't treat each other like they're menial and ordinary, but we honor and we give weight and we give value because if Jesus loved him enough to go to the cross for him, okay, I can't control him. I can't, I can't control myself and I can't control him, but my choice is to go as I receive and I need to love to flow to him from me, then I just need to receive, but I need to honor you and value you. I need to see you as honorable and valuable and worth what Jesus paid for you. Some of us need to go back to that because we've got into the trap of treating people like they're ordinary. And the sons of God and the daughters of God are far from ordinary. They were bought at a great price. Amen? Now, I have a wee feeling that in your life and in mine and in the life of this church, that life flows whenever that happens. Because there's no control, and when there's no control, there's just life flowing. And there's flow and there's abundance as we do what? We see each other as Jesus sees us. In the same way that I need his love and his grace every day, I understand that he needs it, but I can't do that naturally, so I receive. But my choice is to go. You are not what you do. You are who he says you are. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how we can even stand in the church and go, oh, Jesus, thank you, your mighty cross. I love that. It will never lose its power for me. Amen. See that slobber there? Flip me. <laughs> that doesn't strike anyone as bonkers. In the same way that he doesn't see us as who, what we do, it's that place of loving and being loved and receiving, going, you know, I can't control people around me. I just need to choose as I receive to see you, not as what you do, not judging you in that way, but simply to go, you're a son. My choice is to see you as a son. I'm not going to treat you like you're ordinary. I know that in myself I can't do that, so I need to receive more love. But my choice is to go, I'm going to give you honor and weight and value because he says you're worth it. And in that place, the interesting thing is, it's not about him. It's about you. You've just walked free. Life flows. I think of those sick people in those stories, the story of Jesus. The only time, we, we, we can come at the story from the whole thing of belief and faith, which, which I've done and I've, I've preached. But it's interesting when you see honor sitting at the middle. And where Jesus was not honored, there was no life that flowed. 